This is One on One. Do you miss combat at all? Yeah, I do. We were stopped at a rebel checkpoint. And like 50-50, we're, they're going to shoot all of us. And uh, I just went numb. The four of us would set out from Washington, D.C. and walk north. Walking along the railroad lines is completely illegal, so we would have to move fast and stay out of sight. We would have a 300-mile conversation about war. There was nothing. There was nothing to hide behind. About what it does to you and about why you miss it. That is uh, from Last Patrol, and uh, Sebastian Younger is the filmmaker uh, also in that film. Talk to us about The Last Patrol. What is it and why does it matter? I wanted to get to know my country again. I'd been overseas a lot covering wars. Um, and I knew other vet as a journalist, I knew other veterans who had been soldiers who were also having a similar problem. Um, there's a central sort of confusing thing about war is that often when people come back from war, they miss it. They miss the worst thing that's ever happened to them. Uh, it also, it's because it's also the most compelling thing and where they probably experience the, the greatest closeness with other people, uh, people of their unit, for example. And what I wanted to do was walk through this country and railroad lines seemed like the most interesting way to do it. Um, railroad track goes straight through the middle of everything. It doesn't take any prisoners. It goes right through ghettos, right through rich suburbs, right through industry. You really see America from the inside out. Uh, it also, in some ways, is safer. I mean, walking along roads is, is quite dangerous. The railroad track, it's illegal, uh, but you don't have car traffic. You just have to not get hit by trains. And you from have, where to where? We walk from Washington, D.C. Uh, to Philadelphia, then we turn west. We were going to go to New York, and then we turned west at Philadelphia and went to Pittsburgh. Get stopped? Yeah, once we got stopped by the cops, he let us go. Uh, at one point, they had a helicopter looking for us. You know, it's a national asset. It's dangerous, it's private property, they don't like it. So there was a helicopter looking for us one night, they couldn't find us. We, there was a lot of cat and mouse with the police. Sleep? Where? Anywhere. Eat? We, di we didn't have tents, so we slept under bridges, and in, in the woods, uh, abandoned buildings. We did were, not have tents? No, we were vagrant. Yeah, tents attract attention. You can't pitch a tent in a suburb in someone's backyard. So if you're, you're, you have to be totally below the radar, because what we were doing was illegal. So, so we really were vagrants, except it was a sort of high-speed vagrancy. Like we were moving 10 to 20 miles a day. How many, how long did it take? We did it over the course of a year, multiple trips. I wanted to walk it each season. So we'd walk 70, 8, 90, 100 miles at a trip. Uh, and uh, so, you know, it was over the course of a year, it was about 350 miles. Who were the other guys? One was Brendan O'Byrne, a good, good friend of mine. I knew him out at OP Restrepo, this outpost that I covered for the film Restrepo. We're gonna be showing that in just a little bit, I'm sorry. Go yeah. Dave Rolls uh, was also in the service. I knew him at Restrepo. Brendan was out of the service. Dave was about to get out of the service. Uh, both of them were sort of struggling with giving war up. Like, how do you come home? How do you not go back to war? And then the, the, the last guy other than me was Guillermo Cervera, a wonderful Spanish photographer who I'm now very good friends with. He was with my friend Tim uh, when he died. When Tim was bleeding out in the back of a rebel pickup truck, Guillermo was holding his hand. And I became very good friends with Guillermo. He was not going to go back to war either. Neither was I. After Tim got killed, I decided to end it. So we were all taking this trip. There's Tim. There's Tim right there. Tell us about Tim. Tim was my colleague and friend uh, making Restrepo. Uh, we were out at um, the small American outpost for weeks at a time uh, shooting video. And we got very, very close. He was a brother. Um, and he was killed in Libya in a mortar attack in tw April 2011, totally changed my life. I immediately stopped war reporting, like within an hour of hearing that he, was, that he died. Before we show the clip of Restrepo, I I'm curious about a couple of things. You know, when I asked you why you did this, you said you wanted to fall in love with the country again? Yeah, I mean, I think if you walk through this country, you do kind of fall in love with it. Um, Let me fall in love. It's an amazing place. It's the most ethnically varied place I've ever been, country I've ever been in. Um, it's, the people are incredibly generous, particularly in poor communities, not so much in rich communities, but in poor communities, they're very, very generous. Very poor concerned. people are more generous. Oh, way, way more. And less paranoid. Uh, the really bitter people, you know, this is a time of great change in America. Um, 
the people who were really bitter were sort of middle class white people. Um, people, people, people like myself, basically. I don't know. I think maybe they think they've lost more and the poor people didn't have much to lose in the first place. I don't know. If you go, one question we asked people was, what do you like best about this country? You know, if you walk around asking people, what do you think of this country? They just complain a lot, right? <laughs> and they complain a lot in, in sound bites that they heard on TV. And it's not yeah. that interesting. But if you say, what do you like best about this country? It brings, it brings out some interesting things. And one of the things I noticed was that in poor communities, you know, we walk right through Baltimore, the ghettos of Baltimore, all over. Incredibly poor. Every other building's burned down. It's crazy. Well, those train tracks, you can see when you're taking a train right. down to Washington. Yeah. Boy, you can see in Baltimore. Yeah, it looks rough. like some future apocalypse of the world. It's incredible. And in those poor communities, if you ask, what's the best thing about this country? Invariably, people say it's a free country. We're free. <coughs> wow. Free. And in, in wealthy communities, they tend to say it's the land of opportunity. Um, Restrepo, before we show a clip. What does the name mean? What is it? O.P. Restrepo was an outpost, a 20-man position in the Korangal Valley of eastern Afghanistan, where I spent um, a year off and on with Tim. Let's take a look at uh, Restrepo, and we'll come back and we'll talk. The rest of us who have never served and will not, do we have any idea? Any idea? Could we even imagine what war is like? I think people would be surprised by the reality of war. I think they'd be surprised at how, um, you know, war movies are quite sanitized. I mean, what munitions do to the human body is pretty unimaginable. Um, but there's also another side to it. There's an awful lot of caring, an awful lot of connection in a unit in combat. You don't just see the animal nature of, uh, of human beings. You see this other, um, this other very profound aspect, which is tremendous inner reliance and generosity and connection. Um, and that, I think that's the brotherhood, basically brotherhood. I think that's what people miss. That's what soldiers miss when they come back. Is that what they want to go back to? Yeah, I think so. They don't want to go back to the, the violence. The, the, the... Well, I think they enjoy the combat. I mean, combat is quite an adrenaline rush. And I think they're young men, and they, I think they, they enjoy that. But what they really miss, I think that what they really deeply miss is that brotherhood connection. And they come back to this society. It's such a messed up society. Um, they don't fit in anymore because, frankly, they're, they're trying to fit into an unhealthy paradigm and they suddenly realize it. To what degree do you feel that doing what you've done professionally um, makes it harder for you? Because you, you, keep, you keep talking about they <clears throat> have a harder time adjusting or to fit, fitting yeah. in. Do you think it's harder for you to fit in? You know, journalists are different. They're not in a platoon. Uh, journalists operate relatively independently in most war zones. Um, when I was with 2nd Platoon, I had a slightly different experience because I was with the platoon, even though I was a journalist. But for most of my reporting has been in war zones, civil wars, starting in the early 90s. You don't get that feeling of incredible connection. What you do get is, and you miss, is this feeling of importance. Like, my God, this is, these are very important events. I'm reporting on them. It, you know, sort of, it feels meaningful and intoxicating. That absolutely is hard to give up, and just the adrenaline of the job. What soldiers invariably get, the, the, the positive side of what they get, is this connection. And that's not something journalists necessarily get, although I did with Second Platoon. But it's interesting. I'm a journalist, you're a journalist, but we're not the same kind of journalist. No, that's true. You know, I mean, you, I, I'm, I'm curious to the degree to which you connect with these uh, soldiers. But men and women? No, they're just men out there. Just men. Yeah. You connect with them on a very human, personal level. Um, that is something that's hard for the rest of us <coughs> broadcasters, journalists, to experience. Um, objectivity mean anything to you? Oh, I, objectivity is very important. I don't think it's achievable. But say I, it again. I don't think it's achievable. I was going to say that. Yeah. Yeah. Particularly in your case. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't in my case. I wasn't interested in objectivity. I wasn't reporting on the war. I was right. reporting on the experience of men in combat in a telling a story. Yeah. And those those soldiers are not objective. They're extremely subjective. And I wanted to understand their experience. There's, there were other great journalists out there who were objectively reporting on the war as a whole. They had that covered. I was trying to understand what it was like to be a soldier. And, and before I let you out of here, um, for the rest of us, the, the most significant message that you would like your films to send to the rest of us? Simplistic question, I know, but... 
I think the most dangerous thing that's happening in America right now is the idea that things that are happening in this country are somehow not happening to all of us. So right. if we go to war, if the country goes to war, there are people, I know them, some of them are my friends, who think the war belongs to the soldiers or belongs to the Republicans. It's not true. It belongs to all of us. People, if there are poor communities in this country, all of us are impoverished. It's not those people's problem. I hope that my, my work communicates that. Well, um, it's important work. Sebastian Younger, the filmmaker, um, Last Patrol. And by the way, again, just one more time, the, the other film is? Uh, Restrepo. Restrepo. Gall is the follow-up to Restrepo. I made a film about Tim named, uh, called Which Way is the Front Line from Here? Which Way is the Front Line from Here? About, about your friend Tim? About Tim, his work, his death, his life. Uh, and then finally, The Last Patrol. You're doing uh, incredibly important work, which is an understatement. Thank you. And um, we appreciate you joining us in public broadcasting. We hope that uh, as many people as possible see your work and are moved by it. And, um, and just thank you very much, Sebastian, for joining thank us. Thank you. I appreciate okay. it. Um, I just want to make sure. By the way, uh, uh, November 10th, HBO is The Last Patrol, right? Yep. Um, and folks, just go on Sebastian's website to find out the rest of the information. Thanks. We'll see you next time on One on One from Lincoln Center. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Holy Name Medical Center, Berkeley College, Qualcare Inc., NJM, Wells Fargo, New Jersey Natural Gas, and by the Russell Berry Foundation. Promotional support provided by Commerce Magazine and by NJ Biz, all business, all New Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.